Welcome back. I'm Pastor Cat. This is your weekly encouragement. Hey, if you are following along with us, you know we are in our series of the 50 most influential people in the Bible as laid out by National Geographic magazine. People have asked me if these 50 are laid out in order, like the top 50. The answer is kind of, but they're done chronologically, so it is not a countdown or anything of that nature. What makes them the 50 most influential? Well, that would be based on their influence on culture, art literature, sculpture, architecture, all of those things. Last week we started with Adam and Eve. We're going to continue our series with Cain and Abel. If you notice, there is a painting here behind me uh, by Titan. This is called Cain and Abel. What's interesting about this particular piece of artwork is that it was originally painted and hung on a ceiling in Spain. It's currently not on a ceiling. It's actually painted on canvas, which is very strange to hang, put it on canvas and then put it on a ceiling. Uh, but it's been taken down and stretched. And now you can see it, I believe, in the National Gallery in London. What people really love about this particular painting is all of the curvatures you find, especially in Cain himself. He's the one on top there. And all those curvatures really were unusual for that time period, uh, which was... 1542 to 1544 is when this was painted. Those curves and that muscular structure was very different. Uh, most people believe that the artist was attempting to make this look very active and very um, dynamic. And I, I think he's done a wonderful job. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump in to give you a little background about who Cain and Abel were. If you know a little bit about the Bible, you know Cain and Abel were Adam and Eve. Eve's children. We get most of the story over in the book of Genesis. I'm going to read through it, but roughly to summarize, uh, Cain and Abel were asked to bring offerings, Old Testament style. Uh, one brings an appropriate offering and one does not, and then there is a fight, and then God lays down his judgment. Well, let's go ahead and jump into the passage. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought the first firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. And then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you. But you must master it. Cain told Abel his brother, and it came about when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. From this story, we don't know a whole lot about their background, other than these were two brothers. Their lives were intertwined. We don't know if there was some sort of argument prior to this, or whether they had been in the outs or on the outs for a long time or not. So the offering was given. One, of course, follows the Old Testament laws and sacrifices appropriately, and Cain did not. And so because of this, one offering was accepted and one wasn't. Time came that they are in the field alone. Cain rose up and killed Abel. You know, ever since the very beginning of time, violence has been a part of human history. Some of the greatest bits of literature not only talk about violence, but actually use Cain as sort of a symbol for violence as a whole. One that you may have heard of is War and Peace. It is, of course, a famous bit of literature and does point out that war stems all the way back to Cain. And this goes through us today. I don't know if you struggle with anger. I know that at times I have. And so when you are in this stressful situation, like Cain is here, and that object of your frustration is right in front of you, we do have a choice. We can rise up and lead ourselves right into violence, or we can choose to go the other way. Now, the murder has been 
completed. And God then has a chance to intervene and lay down judgment, which he does over in verse 10. The Lord then said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? You may have heard that before. Am I my brother's keeper? This is where it comes from. Oftentimes you hear that quoted um, when someone is trying to get out of the way of some sort of um, an inquiry they don't want to answer. You might want to know that it is Cain you're quoting when you say that. So here comes God's judgment. He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you're cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground or from your face. I will be hidden and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. Cain's punishment is that he would be the wanderer. Now, this piece of scripture has been depicted a number of times. One of my favorite is done by William Blake in 1825. That is here. This particular um, piece of artwork is called Cain Fleas, and it is done on a panel. As we just mentioned, the last piece of artwork we looked at was done on canvas. This would have been done on panel, more than likely a hardwood of some sort. I just love the graphic depiction it looks very modern, right? Like it could have been done yesterday, uh, but the colors are striking. And you really see that um, anguish in Cain's face as he has been sent away. You may have noticed on the way by in this passage a couple things. One is he would no longer be able to sustain himself by growing things from the ground. Remember, his offering was fruits and vegetables. Now he doesn't even have that. So God's punishment was twofold. One, you can't grow anything. Number two, you will now have to be a wanderer. Not only that, God says he puts a mark upon him where no one is to kill him. So he would have to live out all the days of his life wandering, not able to make a living from the ground, dealing with the grief of killing his brother. Today, in sort of modern literature, there is a thing that is used quite often, especially in fantasy literature, called the Mark of Cain. Now, the Mark of Cain looks like this. There you go. Get a good view of it. And the Mark of Cain, that actually comes from a painting by Peter Paul Rubens in 1600 called The Slaying of Abel. You'll notice the weapon being used here is very similar to this Mark of Cain. People will tattoo that upon themselves today in modern society to say that there's no place for them, that they're kind of a wanderer, they don't fit in anywhere. And modern vampire movies and books talk about the mark of Cain as in a person who cannot be killed and their punishment is they will wander and not die. There's no reason to believe biblically here that Cain lived forever. However, we know that there was a seven-fold punishment for anyone who attacked Cain and took his life in vengeance. So the question that leaves us as believers or those who are studying the Bible was, what was God's point? Was this a punishment in regards to he would have to suffer with the knowledge of killing his brother? Or is the message that we're supposed to take that vengeance for the sake of violence or vengeance to pay off violence, violence for violence, is not an answer whatsoever? I'll let you wrestle with which of those things God intended. I think both are likely candidates. The one thing I do want to leave you with first, does it take more courage to love your enemy or does it take more courage to attack and try to destroy your enemy? 
I think the answer is pretty clear. It is much harder, much more courageous, much more righteous a stance to go ahead and love those we're opposed to, even if the sight of them turns our stomach and brings us to rage like it has Cain here. Well, I pray this has been as encouraging for you as it has been for me. God bless. I'll see you next week. Thank you.